Um, so my name is Brock, A Wade on the internet, and if you were confused, this is Pro Voices 2010, 11, something. Um, I often forget to put my employer on there, even though they often pay for my trips. I work at liquidation.com, they're nice, they have lots of Pearl stuff, and their name is really scary, um, but actually, they're not like evil, they don't like. You know, liquidate your mother's oh, house when she dies or something. Yo, people in the liquid when they stare at them. Uh, yeah, but it takes like half an hour. People move. It's really annoying. Um, no, there is an auction website like other auction websites, except we have warehouses, and so I work on the inventory management system. So I guess that's the difference. People send us their junk. We store it into you know categories of junk, and then we sell it to other people. Anyway, and I have a Mansi. I didn't realize I could sit, so I hooked up some magical. Thing because all right, HTML unit is uh, for doing stuff with the web. The things we generally want to do with the web, from sort of a automation temp, uh, standpoint, uh, the big two are scraping uh, and testing. Uh, because whenever it gets down to it, the web is just just a dumb terminal. <laughs> All right, we'll scrape, test, the web. Okay, that's better. Um, awesome. <laughs> so, so, but really, um, but really, uh, we're dealing with smart terminals these days. They're not, you know, just things looking at. They have JavaScript. But much worse, or much better, I don't know, um, they have all kinds of other things. They have multiple windows, and they have frames, and they have like asynchronous you know, server communications, and things like this. Uh, so for a long time, dealing with the web, uh, I've looked at different things to uh, try to deal with this. Um, Mechanize is great for you know, non-dynamic things. Uh, I've also looked into Selenium. Selenium has made great progress since I looked into it. Uh, so, but it still takes quite a bit to set up, is my rough understanding. Though I hear they're coming out on 2.0 soon, which would be cool. Uh, and, you know, there's lots of, there's several competing technologies. Uh, in fact, I saw a talk earlier today about um, Moz REPL, which sounds pretty cool. Uh, so, the thing I like about HTML units is that it's headless. This is a completely server side library that you run, so, like Mechanize. Uh, it has it executes JavaScript. Uh, it can deal with multiple windows, frames, even the little pop-up confirmation dialogs. The only thing that was a little bit scary to me was that it's a Java library. I happen to, you know, write Perl and not Java so much, uh, but easily fixed with the magic that is inline Java. Uh, oh, wow, this thing actually works. Really well. I'm, I was su very surprised. You know, usually I do these things as experiments. What horrible Frankenstein thing can I make today? <laughs> but um, I was like, all right, let's try this out. And with inline Java, I was able to make www.html units, which is up on CPAN. It's uh, what I did was actually bundle together all of the uh, the jar files and all of that stuff. So you install this, and you get all of the all of HTML units. Uh, bundle it together, it sticks it in your lib somewhere, and uses it. Uh, inline Java does neat stuff with exposing the Java namespaces and things to Perl. Uh, neat stuff that is sometimes annoying. Uh, so I started to write HTML unit suite, which makes it a little more Perlish. Maybe glosses over some of the um, Java aspects of it that don't quite fit. Uh, I'm still adding to this, but it's a pretty good start. So, uh, I promised on my thing that I would tell you guys how to install it, in case you wanted to install it. Something. Uh, I use um, Debian derivatives, and uh, that's pretty much it. This is the trick right here. This uh, exporting your little Java home thingy, that's something you need to make uh, inline Java install. Without that, Inline Java spits out an error that doesn't really help very much. Um, I think I might have sent them a patch, a documentation patch, basically. But uh, nonetheless, if you do that, then whenever you install 
www.html unit, it'll pull in inline Java, and this at least works on a clean uh, Debian install. I've also done this on one of our work servers, which is an uh, older, uh, I don't know, Red Hat Enterprise 3, which we now are decommissioning. And uh, it has older Java's, like some hand installed Java 1.5.0, and it works there too. I just had to point it to a different Java. But, of course. And then you can use it. Uh, simple example, I'm going to just talk about um, the sweet module because the other one isn't as sweet. Uh, in some ways, you use this kind of like you would mechanize. Uh, how I should ask, are you, anyone here not familiar with www mechanize? Not familiar. Uno. Dos. Tres. Dos. Okay. Um, that's cool. Uh, it's basically a class that is a web browser. So you instantiate it, you tell it what URL to fetch, and uh, you can do stuff with it. Um, Mechanize mostly works with the raw text. One of the really big differences with HTML unit is that it's more of a full browser than Mechanize. Um, now, when I say browser, it doesn't have a rendering engine. You can't actually see it. But it does, uh, it does actually parse the DOM, and it uses um, Rhino is the JavaScript engine it uses, uh, which works pretty darn well. Um, you could do, I mean, since it has the DOM, you can actually like get things by XPath. I don't know if that's proper XPath or not, um, but in theory it is. Good enough. And you can do things like get element by ID and traverse it, kind of like you would in JavaScript, for example. Uh, whereas with uh, WWW mechanize it works more on a text regex type basis, though there are things you can do to it to feed it to other modules. But anyway. um, however, you do have to deal with some Java ness. Uh, this get by XPath actually returns uh, some kind of a container object, and then you have to call to array on it to get an actual array ref. If that makes any sense at all. Which brings me to an important point, well, I'll not switch to computer mode, which is documentation. I want to show you how you actually use this a little bit. Um, mostly, you install it, which is easy, but then you'll be like, all right, well, how am I going to find uh, get element by D, or even uh, get element by XPath, right? Um, so, Google HTML unit documentation, and you have to read the Java doc documentation. But I'll just show you uh, one really easy example here, which is the, th the top level object that you work with is a web client. And a web client uh, has the big thing. So they have, I don't know, get cookies and get uh, home page, get the current window, for example, returns you a web window object. Uh, and then you can use that object for other stuff. The Sweden version of this works by, usually when you're looking at a web browser, you have your overall browser, but then you have a current window, and in that current window you have a page you're looking at, and in that page you usually even have like an element that's focused. So uh, the Sweden module will just do a little bit of auto-load. Their namespace doesn't overlap in their method names, so you call uh, get element by XPath or whatever it's called. Let's see. Download. Yeah, get by XPath. And it will try it on the browser level, which there is no method for that. And it'll try it on the window level, and there is no method on that. It'll try it in the current frame, and there is no method for that. And then it'll try it in the current page, and that's where it'll find the method which it inherits from this DOM node. Uh, so for the most part, um, you have some idea of what you want, and you grab through this documentation and find what it is that already does it. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, you can see that usually, sometimes there's uh, multiple methods based on what types of parameters they pass. Um, but things generally just kind of work. You pass it what it asks for. And, you know, most of them take a string, so if you have like a something that declares the URL or get frame by name, takes a string, just a regular Perl string is fine, you don't have to make 
Java object string or something. Uh, and it'll return you this frame window thing, and you can go and see what kind of stuff it does. Like, you can get the enclosing page on a frame, things like that. Any questions about reading documentation? I know it's something that you're like, oh, I can read documentation, but uh, it actually helps to see it one time. So, documentation. And, uh, like I said, for the most part, things translate, but every now and then you'll have to you'll have to call to array. That's the biggest uh, one that I've run into a lot, where they return a list of things and you have to explicitly do to array. So I'm actively working on a way of adding that to the, the sweetened one so that you don't have to think about it anymore. Uh, I have an example from my work. And I'm wondering how I'm doing on time. What am I, halfway-ish? Give or take, all right. So at my work, like I said, we do uh, this inventory management system. And I have this one particular application where I wanted to test a lot of stuff. So the, the example I'm about to show you tests uh, cursor focus, which is one I'm really excited about. I don't know why, but um, whenever you're working through and you're trying to optimize a workflow uh, in a web page, you want to care about where the, the cursor goes. And after they're done with this field, it should go to that other field. And that's something that seemed, you know, traditionally it was hard to test, but with this, it works really well. Um, Key presses, in other words, actually sending key press events. Um, it's changing the page and doing some AJAX. And there's even a confirmation dialog in one of these examples. Uh, so this is the, the screen, the website that I'm actually scraping. Uh, this is part of a warehouse inventory system. The main thing is that they have to enter in some task that they're working on. Then they're going to scan some barcodes. And when they scan a barcode, the little scanner thing, it automatically just goes to the next field. and uh, one of these tests even uses this auto expand items thing. So I will now show you code. Show me code. Okay, I'll show you some code. Okay. Mm -hmm. Blah, blah, blah. It does some stuff. Um, we uh, wrapped up HTML unit in our own wrapper layer, some of which started there, and then I moved into HTML suites, and some of which didn't belong in suite, so it stays there. Um, for example, we have our own authentication, where it authenticates to the site. Uh, basically, it's generating a uh, cookie on the server side. Mm -hmm. All right, so the first thing it does uh, after it loads the page, uh, this LSI get, like I said, is an internal one, so it just knows our domain and everything. But it loads up this, uh, C this barcode loading tool. And the first thing it does is to get the focused element get the ID of it, and make sure that it's the one we expect to be focused. Which is very straightforward. And the test is initial focus on task ID. Um, which works. And then we type in some stuff in the task field, <coughs> three and two, and hit enter. Um, one thing that Mike and I have run into is that we can't tell if it should be slash n or slash r. Uh, this one seems to pass most of the time. But another one, we had to use slash r, and we don't really know why. So. Fire everywhere again. Um, when you hit enter, it's supposed to go to the next field, so we just check to make sure that now the focused element is the scan ID, and we scan some barcode. We check to make sure that the now it's jumped over to some other thing, um, the current item it's supposed to be on. We don't know the full ID of this <coughs> item because it has some internal identifier, so we actually use a regex. We're like, well, if the ID starts with this, it's close enough. Um, and we do some other stuff. I don't know what that is. All right, make sure the quantity is defaulting to one, because we had some bug where it was defaulting to zero all the time. People are mad. It's very sad. So um, is this interesting to people? I'm going to keep going. I have like two more of these. All right, fine. No complaints. So uh, this is another test. Um, in this one, we're checking that auto expand uh, functionality. Uh, if you remember, we have a little checkbox over there, auto-expand items. Each of these little blue arrows, whenever you click on them, uh, it opens up a list of the full details for that particular item. Uh, things that are seller-specific, uh, make model, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it does it through Ajax, so it's actually doing background. So it isn't preloaded all of those. Um, so they got really tired of hitting that arrow every single time. 
Uh, in certain cases, whenever they scan an item, there's only one that ever comes up, and they always want it to auto-expand. So we're like, okay, we'll give you a little auto-expand button, and you can choose. Um, someday we'll rewrite this application, and things like this might be on by default, but you know, that goes. So this is to test the auto-expand capabilities. Um, so anytime you're testing, you want to make sure the universe is uh, consistent. So first we try it without the checkbox. Uh, to make sure things don't auto-expand. And then we try it with the checkbox to make sure that they then auto-expand. So we, uh, we load up our tool, we make sure there's a task, we type in whatever our current task is, uh, scan. And so to check whether or not, um, to check whether or not we've auto-expanded, I'm, yeah. I'm actually looking at the style attribute. So this is something I was uh, complaining to Mike about. I don't think there's a technology maybe it's a philosophical impossibility to actually tell if something is visible to a user because it could be obscured by some other thing floating above it or you know absolutely positioned something like that you could or render it and analyze the bitmap I could render it and analyze a bitmap um, and then I'd also have, you know maybe take a translucency into account or some crazy thing like that but the bitmap would do it yeah you should feel enough of bitmap yeah all right so you get on that image analysis image analysis might solve that problem it's but I think that probably is. Okay. In the meantime, uh, I just looked at the CSS attribute. <laughs> What's that? It never builds. Fails to install. Wow, that's too bad. Um, which is very straightforward. I check to make sure that the attribute of my little expandy div is displayed on. So that's very simple. And then, uh, and then we start it over. Uh, this time, I actually check the auto expand checkbox here, and then we do pretty much the same thing. In my philosophy of writing tests is that the test should be the most stupid part of my code, and if it ends up having a little bit of duplication, I'm much happier with that in the test than anywhere else. Anywhere else I'd be like, Psh, make that into a subroutine. Um, but we've had uh, some tests that were abstracted, I guess, in a way that didn't make any sense, and they were all parameterized and things and it just confused everything. Whereas whenever I have this entire chunk duplicated twice, it's really easy to read and verify that it's correct. Um, of course, the balance is that you can't let that get too far. If you find yourself really doing the same thing over and over all the time, then you know it might be time. But usually that's between tests, not within a test. That's kind of the mark that I use. Anyway, a little side lecture. So I'm, I'm, Give I'm me. fascinated with this testing that you're doing. Um, but how would you even begin to test cross-browser issues? I mean, like None of that. Yeah. Good question. I No, the HTML unit people might disagree with me. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't attempted to test any cross-browser issues. Okay. Uh, so the goal of this is not to test cross-browser. The goal of this is more um, regression within a known browser. Right. So HTML unit is effectively a browser. They do try to implement quirks. Whenever you uh, create an instance of it, mm -hmm. you can tell it, I want you to be like Firefox 3, or I want you to be like IE7. Oh, neat. Okay. I have no idea how compliant that is. Okay. They are trying, though. And so... So what is it, what is it by default fit closer towards Firefox? It seems to be fitting closer toward Firefox, but... Um, but based on the work I do, I don't have to deal with it directly. Okay. So I don't have any experience to okay. really say for sure. Um, however, uh, whenever other things are doing like browser sniffing type stuff, which Google does a lot, mm -hmm. I've had to explicitly declare it as one or the other, and it made things work much better. Okay. Uh, and I didn't see a rhyme or reason. I switched randomly, and then sometimes Google stuff would work, and sometimes it wouldn't. So uh, I think in one case it like worked better if it was Firefox uh, and Three, and in another case, it worked better if it, I just told them it was IE seven. And it's more—it is more than just the user agent that they're switching. Right. They are actually trying to do um, duplicate behavior. Duplicate behavior, yeah. So it's definitely their goal, and to the point where if you found something that varied, they would probably want you to submit a bug. Okay. So, um, but I can't vouch for how well it actually works. I something that I I like to brag about for this thing a lot is. Uh, as an example of its functionality, they've 
been very pleased in the last several revisions, which is like two years now. They can pass the entire jQuery test suite, and they can pass like 98% of the Yahoo test suite. They can pass all of the, whatever the one that starts with the D test suite. Whatever it is. Anyway, uh, so it, it runs, at least the JavaScript part of it, really well. And then with jQuery, that's also hitting some dumb stuff. Yeah. But I don't know how, I don't know if they had to run it under a certain browser to get it to do that or okay. what. So the, the, how I got to this was, um, was trying to do Selenium for personal testing and it being just way too big. Um, but in the end, for a big enough application, you're still going to want to do cross-browser testing in a real browser. And that's when Selenium would probably win. Um, one idea might be to make a magical compatibility layer. Oh, actually, one of the things I just read last week is that Selenium 2 has an HTML unit backend. Mm -hmm. So it could be that maybe Selenium will ultimately be the way to go. Um, but you still have to set up a Selenium server and all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah. All right, last demo. Uh, this one's messy because we haven't refactored it. Sorry, Mike, it's messy. <laughs> Maybe it's just because uh, my screen is smaller than his. Um, the main thing that this is doing different than the others that I wanted to highlight is right here. Uh, in this particular one, they asked us on the tool that if we had uh, lauded too many things and they were going to do an overage where we were receiving even more than we had scheduled to receive, it needs to do a pop-up that says, yo, are you serious? You really want to just make new inventory out of nowhere? This seems like a bad idea, people. Press OK if you want to anyway, That's the default because you can't change it. Um, and so this is actually a, a test for that. And uh, this is something we haven't uh, sweetened yet. But effectively, you can make a confirm handler um, and uh, tell it basically when the next confirmation thing comes up by doing the set confirm handler. The next time you see a confirmation box, just hit OK, or hit Cancel, or whatever. So you can you have to kind of know what's going to happen in this case. Um, is there a way to make it so it's dependent on like the content, Mike? Or is that not a feature yet? Uh, the content of the page? Of the confirm box, dialog box. Oh, the dialog? Um, it will store the dialog in the array. You can check the array. And then and then call the set handler? No. I don't know. No, anyway. no, that would have to be on why. So uh, we'll figure that out. But the point is that you can actually uh, have prompts and pop-ups and things like that that you can handle. Um, you can set what their event handler is. You can also monitor things in the background, like uh, whether or not there's any AJAX requests currently running. Uh, it's effectively another process that's running this Java engine. So it's asynchronous to your code, which also means that, like Selenium, you may find spots where you need to sleep a little bit or specifically watch for some DOM element to uh, you know, stabilize, I guess. Um, okay. What else do I have here? Oh, yes, this is available on CPAN. Am I out of time anyway? I think I am. So it's available on CPAN. Um, I highly recommend you try it. Feel free to give me any bug reports or especially any ideas to sweeten it more. Uh, one larger goal might be making like a mechanized compatible uh, API to it. That'd be kind of fun. Uh, but sounds like a lot of work, so I haven't actually like done that yet. And that is all. Thank you. Thank you.